Hello everyone, this is Anya. In this video I'm continuing the series on Jubilees. This is the let's see, this is the fourth video, this is the third one in the actual going through the studying of Jubilees specifically. The first one we did was an overview of the entire book and its significance, but this one, uh, the, these last three so far have been actually diving into the text and, and giving summaries of various portions of the Book of Jubilees and giving uh, my thoughts on that. So we continue in this week and uh, this one is Fo this one focuses strongly on on the covenant of Noah and the original law. That's the big focus of this study that we do. So it's definitely jam packed. This is one of my. I think this is one of the better studies on Jubilees that we did so far. It has a lot of gems in it and a lot of wonderful truths that have been lost to a lot of people. So this is important for how much information is contained in it. That's significant information. Um, with that said, I just want to say that I, I want to talk about the Patreon supporters. So for those of you who would rather just skip this, feel free to do so and go skip ahead to where the video actually starts. But so basically, uh, my, my Patreon is, I'll give you the link, it's patreon.com slash dead sea schools religion. And I've got two supporters. One is supporting directly through Patreon and another is supporting through PayPal. Now if you don't want to support me through Patreon but you do want to support me a different way, you can, you can use PayPal or you can use Facebook or Google. There's different ways of donating. And the advantage of donating a different way other than Patreon is you actually pay, pay a little bit a portion of the money that you donate through Patreon is sent to Patreon directly as part of the fees. So, for example, I one of the one of my supporters is doing twenty five dollars a month on Patreon, but I only get twenty three dollars from that twenty five because two dollars is taken out as fees for for Patreon. Now, this is this applies to all the big. Uh, donation sites like also like you know GoFundMe for example it has the same feature of the amount that you donate a portion of it is taken out as fees for the convenience of the service but if you want to get around that and you want to donate the full amount you want me to get the full amount that you're trying to donate you can do that directly by such as face through Facebook or Google you can actually send money but uh, these other websites are convenient, as I said, and also um, if you are concerned with Facebook or Google having your private information, uh, it can be a safer for your identity. More, it can be more comforting for you to feel like your information is not in the wrong hands if you're doing it through sites like Patreon or GoFundMe uh, type of thing or PayPal. So um, my one supporter on Patreon is Daniel Simpson. He does $25 a month. And my other supporter uh, is is uh, donating $10 a month. I'm not sure if he wants me to mention his name. So I won't mention his name right now. But um, I'll, I'll ask to see if he wants to be mentioned or not. Um, he actually goes by a different name on Facebook uh, than his actual name, so I don't know if he wants me to say his Facebook name or his real name. So, but I'll figure out that out from him. But so the levels of support are the basic supporter, which is one dollar a month. You, w by doing that, you get recognition in my videos and future publications of books of the Bible. Ten dollars a month. You get one Google Hangouts conference with me every month. $25 a month, you get two Google Hangouts conferences every month. $50 per month, you get three, or excuse me, uh, $50 every month, you get four 
uh, Google Hangouts every month. I said three accidentally, but it's actually four. Um, $100 a month. You, I will visit you once a year, at least. Oh, and by the way, you know, these, these ones, they are guarantees. So, for example, if you just want to have a, a Google Hangouts conference with me without donating anything, that's, I do, I definitely do that with people. Um, I just can't commit to it for ongoing indefinitely. Like, if you want to do a Google Hangouts with me occasionally, I'm definitely open to that. But to commit to one every week or every month, it's too much for me because my time is very limited these days. Uh, but if you're doing, if you're supporting me, you know, uh, my, my job, I, I make about, I get make minimum wage, that's $10.50 a month. Uh, it's not, not a month, what am I talking about? Uh, $10.50 an hour, okay? Um, so, when I do a Google Hangouts with someone, it's about, it's about an hour to two hours in length. And so if you're donating, you know, for the, for the one Hangout, it's $10 every month. So that's about, you know, if, I, if, if we only do an hour, that's about minimum wage. If it's uh, twice a month, $25, again, that's about minimum wage. So you see, um, if you want a guarantee Google conference with me, Google, Google Hangouts conference, guaranteed would cost the, the donation that would be $10 for one, one conference guaranteed a month, and two guaranteed a month is $25, and four guaranteed a month is $50. And that is basically a very fair compensation for my time. One hour, minimum wage, about $10. So it's definitely right in line with um, with that. So then uh, for visiting people, if I want, if you want me to visit you once a year, you know, depend, it depends where you live. If you live very far away, it could be almost a thousand dollars round trip through plane. So. 12, 12 months in a year, it's $1,200, so if I visit you um, once a year, it might be almost the full amount that you're donating, $100 a month. So in many ways, these higher payments are basic, a big portion of it is going to the travel fees that would be required to fulfill that reward. So, but for people who are live closer to me, like in the US, it would be much cheaper for me to visit them. Um, so then there's, uh, so it's $250 a month if you want me to visit you twice a year, $500 a month I visit you three times a year, and $1,000 a month I would visit you four times a year. So those are the levels of support. I don't expect people to do those high levels of, of support, um, but they're there just in case. If someone does want to do that, I would very much like, you know, if you want to donate that much, then you definitely deserve a, a personal visit from me. It's one thing to do a Google Hangouts, and that's a special uh, use of my time, but if you believe in my ministry and the work I'm doing so much that you want to do more than $100, $100 or more, that's a significant amount that you're donating per month, then I want to honor that and respect that and meet you in person because if I meet you in person, I can get a better idea from you what you would like to see from my ministry and my work that I'm doing. If you have specific goals or desires that you want to see fulfilled in my ministry, I want to meet with you in person and sp discuss that specifically with you and, and get to know you better and become friends with you. If that's if you're wanting to donate, be a major uh, supporter like that, $100 or more that definitely deserves uh, an actual meeting with you in person to discuss what you'd like to see from my work that I do. So I'll let all that to say that's that's my my group. Uh, uh, I mean that's my um, that's my ministries, and that's how you can donate if you want to donate. So, anyways, that's that's uh, my introduction, and now here's the series on the Book of Jubilees. Hope you enjoy it. Go then recording. Stephanie's here, and the not-so-new baby now. That's our mascot. Are they 
with you in person or oh, you just on, mean on oh, this time? here we just all of a sudden got a bunch of new people that's a oh cool. nice all right so i'm gonna start where we right about where we left off now jackson um if you are able to find the recording it was when governor was doing it yeah so doing you did it get time. it done mm -hmm. okay right. so when you have the time you know i'll put uh, it up right now oh okay that'd be great great that one actually the, the, the first the first one we did on jubilees a while back i thought went pretty well the second one we did i felt like i didn't do as good of a job last time that we did i thought went really well okay so i think i've got the first two up it's just the last one yeah i couldn't find it until he let me know where it was and it was okay. all the time that's what happens when you get senile <laughs> All right, you said recording already? Yeah, go ahead. All right. I'm, I'm going to mute down. All right, let me... I'm just going to separate the tabs. So this is easier. So, as I've mentioned in the previous teachings, I definitely recommend... The, the best version of Jubilees I recommend is... James Vanderkam. He made an English translation and has a lot of really high quality notes in there. So that's one I use often, but I also use uh, the one by R.H. Charles. And that one's kind of a standard in the field of studying Jubilees. Last time we ended right around when, when the flood was just about to happen. So I'm going to continue with that. Let me get back to that place. So we're like right around in chapter five, I think. Chapter five of Jubilees. And I don't know if we'll get through all this today, but I'm going to try to get up to the time right before the birth of Abraham. But it, 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 there's a lot to cover, so I might not get all the way there. The, other, the thing I want to emphasize for, for the Yahad is that we are trying to emulate the, the Essenes of the past, but in a way that is applicable to modern way of life. Because there's certain things that are more relevant for a physical community in which we don't have a physical community at this time and it's not clear if we ever will with the Yahad organization. So we're trying to implement some of these scene principles while we're scattered across the various places we live. And Jubilees is an important witness to help us kind of identify how to live and the basic the basic theology and concepts of the that the Essenes had in the ancient times. It gives us a good guide of reconstructing the the faith of the apostles and the Messiah because there does seem to be evidence that the Messiah and the apostles themselves did consider Jubilees to be an authoritative text. So if they did then that's why it's important for us to study, to really see what it says and learn from it. So all that said, let's see here. Okay, so chapter the, mi the middle section of chapter 5 of Jubilees, around verse 13, it says, and the judgment of all is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets in righteousness, even all who depart from the path which is ordained for them to walk in. And if they walk not therein, judgment is written down for every creature and for every kind. And there is nothing in heaven or on earth or in light or in darkness or in shul or in the depth or in the place of darkness uh, which is not judged. And all their judgments are ordained and written and engraved. In regard to all, 
he will judge the great according to his greatness and the small according to his smallness. And each and he is not one who will regard the person, nor is he one who will receive gifts. If he says that he will execute judgment on each. If one gave everything that is on the earth, he will not regard the gifts of the person, nor accept anything at his hands, for he is a righteous judge. I read, read that passage because I think it's important to refute a common popular doctrine amongst Christianity, and that is the whole idea that he does respect or regard persons. The basic idea is like, if someone believes in Jesus, they say, they'll be saved from their sins no matter what bad things they do. As long as they have faith, they're not judged by works, they're judged by faith. They're saved by faith, not works. Lest anyone should boast, blah, blah, blah. They use a lot of Paul's uh, phrases, and I think Paul is being misrepresented by these people a lot, but if they are correctly understanding Paul, it doesn't matter because we shouldn't judge based on who is saying it. We should judge based on what is being said. So this particular doctrine <clears throat> is considered contrary to the truth in the scriptures, this idea that if you believe certain things, you won't be punished for your deeds. But that just goes against everything we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's there's certain passages which you could quote out of context which appear to say that we aren't judged for everything we do. But the overall message of Scripture is that we are judged for what we do and that he's a fair judge, so he's not going to be unfair in how he judges people. He... If a person who is not a believer is righteous, he will look kindly on that person. If the person is a believer but is full of evil, then he's going to condemn that person. So this is that principle that Jubilees gives to us. And it's important because in Jubilees, at least at this time that's talking about with the time of Noah, this is before Israel. So there's no Jew, there's no Israel. A Gentile is everybody. Everyone's a Gentile in the time of Noah. So there's this understanding that all people are judged by a universal standard. Um, yeah, so I, I have the PDF. I just saw that people were comment, commenting about uh, Vanderkam. I think it's Vanderkam. Oh, no, wait. Oh, this is a different one. Uh, is that... Is that the same one I'm talking about? Let me see. That's the Hermeneia commentary. It's always one of the best and one of the most expensive. If there is another one, well, I can go take a look. Okay. Well, so so the commentary, I'll have to take a look at that sometime. Uh, um, I'm, we might be able to find a PDF file of the commentary. I don't have one at this moment. But we do have the PDF file of his actual translation that James Vanderkam did. Uh, we have that in the Ahad Facebook group in the file oh, section. Right. I, I uploaded that a, a few weeks ago. So, and that you know that one costs. I think on Amazon it costs something like a hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars to get the the physical copy of the book. So, uh, the fact that we have it in PDF file that's very convenient for our studies. Maybe someday I'll, I'll buy it, uh, the actual book copy, but for now we don't need to because we have that PDF. So at any rate, I think that passage of Jubilee is very important to, ref to a evidence or argument against what Christians say because it's right in line with Ezekiel chapter 18 that, the, that um, a, a man shall not die for the sins of another man. Uh, everyone is going to be held to their own deeds and they'll be judged for their own works. In the Gospel of John, it says, this is the work that you do, that you must do to be saved. You are to believe in him. So according to the Gospel of John, faith is considered a work. And so we are, as James says, we are justified by works and not faith alone. So that that whole principle of James 
and you know the Ahad places a high a high level of respect and admiration for James. He you know the chief one of the chief apostles and we bishop of Jerusalem, and Peter places great authority in James. And so the fact that James teaching agrees with Jubilees is a strong point that we are justified by works and not faith alone. Uh, which verse in Jubilees was I talking about? That is, I would uh, recommend reading the verses the, in the whole, for the whole context to read verses, Jubilees chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. So Jubilees chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. So moving on from that, what's interesting is that it then we then see it says in the children of Israel it, in verse seventeen it says and of the children of Israel it has been written and ordained if they turn to him in righteousness he will forgive all their transgressions and pardon all their sins. It is written and ordained that he will show mercy to all who turn from their, all their guilt once each year. In Charles' version of this. He, R. H. Charles, he puts brackets for verses 17 to 18, because in his belief, in his interpretation, this, these two verses are referring to the Day of Atonement, and if it's referring to the Day of Atonement, that doesn't make sense. Why is it talking about the Day of Atonement when the, the context is talking about the Feast of Weeks, as we will see shortly? The, the whole thing with the Flood is connected with the Feast of Weeks and not the Day of Atonement. So R. H. Charles was like, okay, that doesn't make sense, so this must be a interpolation, or taken from another place in the book and moved here. Transposition, it's called, when it's moved from another part. But I don't believe it's talking about the Day of Atonement. I think it's talking about Shavuot, because as you'll see later in Jubilees, it presents this understanding that every year on Shavuot, the covenant is renewed. And so from how I see it, people have a chance every year to join the covenant and turn from their sins, turn from their guilt. They turn from their guilt by joining the covenant. So it is, he, he will show mercy every year on the Feast of Shavuot by accepting them into this, his covenant. That's how I understand the verses that it's talking about. There, I've mentioned in previous teachings that the Book of Jubilees is connected strongly with the Dead Sea Scroll book known as Genesis Apocryphon. There's so many correspondences, but one of the ones I want to bring to the attention now is the mountain on which the Ark uh, rested. We know in Genesis that it was on one of the mountains of Ararat, but it doesn't say which mountain it was. Well, according to Jubilees, we find out what that mountain was. It's, call, it's called Lubar. So, Jubilees says it's Mount Lubar, and Genesis Apocryphon says the exact same thing. In the Book of Noah, found in the Genesis Apocryphon scroll, it mentions that same detail. So we have two books, the only two books, that say this detail. Jubilees and Genesis of Parkfun are the only two books which specify that the mountain which the Ark rested on was Lubar. So that's a strong connection and shows that Jubilees and Genesis of Parkfun are uh, greatly related and connected. And now the one supports the other. So if the Genesis of Parkfun is authentic, then that makes strong evidence for Jubilees being authentic. On the other hand, if Jubilees is not authentic, then it it brings into question Genesis Apocryphon's authenticity. So let's see, are there, what are the other passages? Which, let's see. Okay. I mean, later on it tells us that Noah was actually buried on Mount Lubar in Jubilee. So that's another interesting detail there. So, now we see that after the flood, Noah 
atones for the earth, and according to Jubilees. Now, he atones with an altar and the animals. And the basic understanding, as we'll see in this chapter, that the earth was made impure by all the blood being shed. That's why a flood came, because it was wiping out the wickedness. But after the flood wiped everything out, the earth still needed to be atoned from all that bloodshed. So, no, the sacrifice to atone for all the guilt of the earth. So, so verse 2, Jubilees chapter 6, verse 2, it says, He made atonement for the earth and took a kid and made atonement by its blood for all the guilt of the earth. For everything that had been on it had been destroyed, except those that were in the ark of Noah. And it gives us the detail of the of the sacrifice. And these this sacrifice that he did is again right in Genesis Apocrypha. Now, there is an interesting thing here where it says this is the same thing as Genesis. It says the Lord smelt the goodly savor. In the Nazarene Acts, specifically in the homilies, it speaks of passages in scripture which are corrupt and who the creator actually is and, and who the, the Father, the Most High is. And one of the things it's, it speaks about is this idea that he, he likes the the smell of the sacrifices and how i understand this to be to present my view on this i i think the basic point is that the father or the creator he didn't regarding the sacrifices it's not like he wanted those sacrifices because he loves the smell that misrepresents who he is because it suggests that he's bloodthirsty and that he it makes him much more human this idea that oh, that's i'm going to accept that sacrifice because that just smells so good you know like that makes him seem um flippant almost i think the actual intention is that he he sees the faith in the person who did the action, and he's very pleased with the pureness of the intention and motivation of the person who brought the sacrifice. So like with Noah and Abraham, they did sacrifice of their own accord, and when he saw that, he was very pleased. So he smelled their sacrifice and was like, this is a good thing because they did this out of a good heart intention. Uh, so he was pleased with how they did it in from their heart and not the he wasn't focusing on that's a good I, I love that's my favorite smell I love the smell of burnt flesh oh that's oh, so good you know so I think that's I think that's what the Nazarene Acts is talking about but I just want to make that connection because I think it's important to have a proper perspective on the Creator. And many times there's passages in Scripture which seem to misrepresent who the Creator is. So that's all to say, all to say on that. So as we know, according to Genesis, there was the covenant that the Creator made to not send a flood ever again to destroy the whole earth. But there's more details to the story, to the covenant of that that the creator made with Noah. Genesis only gives the small little details, but the fuller story is found in Jubilees as well as the book of Noah. The book of Noah being contained in the Genesis Apocryphon scroll. And this fuller story is that the, the covenant of Noah was focused very much on the festival of Shavuot, as well as blood, the shedding of blood. The whole thing with the flood was there was so much bloodshed that completely polluted the earth and brought so much wickedness into the earth. 
they killed humans, they killed each other. So much disgusting abominations that were done. So the covenant made with Noah is to be pure and to, to not shed blood and to respect the blood of all life. And Jubilee tells us the consequences of what happens if that is not done, if, if the blood is not respected, but if it is, if it is wickedly shed. According to the Torah, it, it says, if you do an invalid sacrifice contrary to the law, it's considered bloodshed. Let me see. I think that's in Deuteronomy. Let me just quickly bring that up just to show you guys what I mean. Um, okay, so now as I said, you know, Temple Scroll has a more original version of the of these verses, but overall Deuteronomy in the main essence is the same passages that the Temple Scroll has. So, so it says in Deuteronomy 19 verses 8 to 10, now, if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he swore to your fathers and gives you the land which he promised to give to your fathers, and if you keep all these commandments and do them, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk always in his ways, then you shall add three... Um, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's the wrong one. My apologies. There's a, there's a passage specifically about... about... Uh, about animals. Um, I might not be able to find it, but I know it is there, though. The passage I was accidentally reading was a passage about uh, the cities of refuge and the blood avenger. That's not the one I was trying to find. Let me see here. If I can't find it, I'll just move on. Okay, so for now I can't find it, but there there is a passage in one of the books of the Torah which speaks of if you um, if you kill an animal in a invalid sacrifice, it's considered bloodshed. So it's a serious thing when we we may be held accountable held accountable if we falsely slay the, shed the blood of humans as well as animals. Hold on a sec, the dogs are going crazy. Um, I'll just try to talk over them, but my apologies for the interruption. Shalom everybody, this is the <clears throat> So, So in chapter 6 of Jubilees is what it speaks specifically about the where it focuses greatly on the details of, of the blood. And I'm sorry, I'm just getting really distracted by the dogs. Hold on. While I'm waiting for the sound to calm down, do you guys have any questions about uh, anything in Jubilees so far? Yes. When was the last time you did Jubilees? That I believe we we did uh, two weeks ago. All right. We didn't do it last week, but there was um, with Governor. I believe that was two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, you talked about the Genesis Apocryphon and Jubilees. <clears throat> Would you say that uh, Apocryphon came first? Since uh, you probably think that that is the um, source for Genesis? Oh, I definitely believe uh, it came first, and let's just, I, I think I, I might have mentioned this last time, but I don't know if I did. Uh, but basically, even if both 
works are of a late authorship, like say Second Temple, Second Temple liter literature. Uh, even so, Jubilees makes a lot of claims, and it seems evident to me that Jubilees is saying this book of Jubilees is derived from previous books. Um, like, there's so many places where it basically says there's a book that it's getting this information from in Jubilees. So there, it talks about a book of Noah, a book of Enoch. It mentions the book of Enoch, and we know that Enoch was written before Jubilees. Uh, it speaks of the book of Noah, book of Abraham, a book of Jacob, and there's so many other connections it has with other writings, like the Testaments of the Patriarchs, the 12, the 12 Patriarchs, and, and the, the document found in the Dead Sea Scrolls known as the Testament of Amram. Didn't so, you also say that the, the Genesis Apocryphon and the Book of Lamech were the same? Or am I getting that confused? The, so it was called the Lamech Scroll uh, originally by scholars because when, when they, the, the, the scroll in the first, the Genesis Apocryphon was found in Cave 1. And in that cave, there were a few scrolls that were, were, were major. Uh, one of them being the Isaiah scroll. And, but the Genesis of Parkathon was one of the more poorly preserved major scrolls in there. And the reason uh, it was poorly preserved didn't have a protective cover covering as some of the other ones did. And, but basically, before the technology improved, they wanted to be very careful opening the Genesis of Parkathon scroll. So they, at the beginning, they only took a few pieces off the top and they saw the mention of Lamech in some of the fragments. So they thought, oh, this must be the Lamech scroll, they called it. Later on, when they actually were able to separate all the pieces, all the columns, they realized, oh, it's not the Lamech scroll, it's a, it's a, broader, a broader scroll in line with much of Genesis. So uh, they, called, they started calling it Genesis Apocryphon from then on because it's an apocryphal version of Genesis, it seems. It goes right along with Genesis. It gives the same stories, but in greater detail, typically different order sometimes. So, um, yes, but the Lamech, the Lamech, uh, Book of Lamech is at the beginning of Genesis Apocrypha. And then when, the, when that section of Lamech ends, there's actually a, a line that says, this is a copy of the Book of Noah and then proceeds to the book of the words of Noah, and then proceeds to go on with the book of Noah from Noah's first person account. Which is important because Jubilees seems to be quoting a lot from the Genesis Apocrypha. So the sections on, uh, on Noah, for example, they are evidently derived from the book of Noah section. Okay, with all that said, I'm going to try to get back to this. I'm going to try to ignore the noise, the background noise. So we see here in chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, it says, And you, increase and multiply upon the earth, and become many upon it and be a blessing upon it. The fear of you and the dread of you I will inspire in everything that is on earth and in the sea. And behold, I have given unto you all beasts and all winged things and everything that moves on the earth and the fish in the waters and all things for food. So it sounds like he's saying he's given, he's now giving animals for food. He says, as the green herbs, I have given you all things to eat. But then it says, but flesh with the life thereof, with the blood, ye shall not eat, for the life of all flesh is in the blood. And then it says, why? Because lest your blood, the, your blood of your lives be required. At the hand of every man, at the hand of every, will I require the blood of man. Whoso, and then it says, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So, the passage, however, seems to say that uh, not only will the blood of man be required if they if they 
shed the blood of man, but it also, the blood of man will be required if they eat the blood of animals. There's multiple places where it suggests that. For example, it says, right after it says, and Noah and his sons swore that they would not eat any blood that was in the flesh, and he made a covenant before the Lord God forever throughout all the generations of the earth in this month. It says, um, right immediately after, on this account, this testimony is written concerning you, that you should observe it continually so that you should not eat on any day any blood of beasts or birds or cattle during all the days of the earth. And the man who eats the blood of beasts or of cattle or of birds during all the days of the earth, he and his seed shall be rooted out of the land. And do thou command the children of Israel to eat no blood, so that their names and their seed may be before the Lord our God continually. So what this is telling us is that eating blood is a very serious offense. So serious that you will be destroyed if you do. And I think, I think it's a... A very practical application if you if you don't even approach it from a from a divine God perspective if you approach it from a practical humanist perspective of like a secular perspective if you if you eat blood that's not really healthy for you and it causes diseases I know it's not talking about cannibalism but for example some people who have uh, eaten other humans they got really sick and had these diseases because they ate the blood of, of uh, other humans. But the same thing applies when you're, when, to a lesser degree, when you eat the blood of animals, you will get certain diseases which will root you out from the land, which will destroy you, ruin your health. So it's something to be careful about because that's something I think about sometimes when I, uh, hold on. Yeah? Hey. One second. The clear true. Hello. Uh, sorry about that, guys. So, just just so you guys know, if you don't, if you hadn't known before, I became an uncle a year ago. And uh, that, that was my brother and his daughter. So I was just, they, they just got back from a trip to Canada. So I was just saying hi to them. So apologies for that interruption. Um, so, but so basically, uh, if you, eat, it makes sense that if, if eating blood is unhealthy for humans, and I do believe there is scientific evidence for that, uh, that, that makes sense that we, it will harm our health when we do that. Now, the thing that I struggle with is how do we know what, whether there's blood in the meat or not? I don't agree with what some people believe. I, I know there are some who say that there always is blood in the meat, so you, there's no way to eat meat without also eating blood. Because the, the, the text of these various passages of Scripture don't seem to agree with that position. Instead, it suggests that when there, when the when there's um, when the blood is like when when that I think there's different types of um, there's different types of liquid and I'm not sure which types it's focusing on but um, all that to say it's unclear to me sometimes uh, like if you get the meat in the store. Is that blood, or is that just the? Because some people say that's just the juice of the, the, the meat. Some of the some of the red juice in the packages, they say, oh, that's just uh, that's just a different type of thing. Um, it even even the kosher meat sometimes has this. The kosher meat, when they they go to all that trouble to get rid of the uh, the blood by salting and stuff, but uh, it also sometimes will have that red uh, liquid in it. So that you know that makes me a little bit un uncertain uneasy about it but it's possible that they're right and that's not talking about blood that that's not blood maybe um but especially when you go out to eat um when you go out to eat uh, at restaurants or if you're eating ground beef 
but basically if something's processed processed meat it's more likely to have blood in it if it's a regular if it's like a steak or something it's not as likely to have blood in it but if it's like grounded or processed there's i've heard that there's a lot of stuff mixed in some of this meat some gross stuff sometimes so it's it's something we definitely need to think about because what we put into our body and how long we live and if we will be blessed in our health or not the scriptures are clear that what we eat is very much in a reflection of our purity so if we eat impurely that's going to make our bodies impure and as we know the Essenes as well as the New Testament writings speak of the uh, us as our bodies being temples and temples of the Holy Spirit and so if we pollute our bodies with impure food then that's going to cause the spirit to leave us and we will no longer be under the protection of of holiness and righteousness so that's, this is it's an important thing that's why so much emphasis is put on the blood especially because according to the jubilees in genesis the life is in the blood so uh because the life is in the blood if you if you eat the blood the the life is going to be contrary to your life because um it's almost like like with for example with, with organ donations if you receive an o organ from someone else you have a very high risk of your body rejecting it because it's someone else's life and life some one life and another life does not mix well together if you have other life being put into your life into your mixing with your life it creates an impurity and often leads to rejection you know that's why the whole blood type thing the person needs to have the same blood type to even for it to even be relatively safely received even then i suspect that giving blood may not be all that safe even if it's the same blood type but um so anyways we just gotta be really careful and consider as trying to follow the Essene way the principle of blood because of for example acts chapter 15 one of the minimum requirements it's a minimum requirement is um it's to, uh, blood let me let me read that that one part of acts 15 let me because i forget the exact wording it says abstain from blood so it's a similar principle let me see if any people said here um okay so so it's just something for all of us to consider when we do eat meat i don't advocate for the uh i don't advocate for mandatory ve vegetarianism but i do believe vegetarianism is a superior way to live i don't know if it's necessarily healthier to not eat animals but i think uh i do think it is a higher level of holiness and it also if you're if you're conflicted or concerned about whether you're eating blood or not the safer way to go is to not eat any meat because if you're not eating any meat then you're not eating blood so only those who eat meat are are at risk for violating the terms of the covenant which say do not eat blood so only those who eat meat are at risk for eating blood so if you want to avoid that risk entirely just don't eat animals at all and you will be fine but if you do want to eat animals then you need to be very careful according to jubilees and be respectful of the blood of the animals life that was shed that's my perspective on it anyways now another, another thing which is very interesting that kind of goes against what some people believe in Christianity as well as a lot of people in the hot, yahad, I think, 
believe something similar regarding the sacrifices and the the temple. A lot of people believe that the sacrifices were valid, but that now that the Messiah came, there's no, there's not going to be another temple, and there's not going to be any more sacrifices. That's not needed anymore because now we have, now we have the Messiah's priesthood. We don't need that past stuff anymore. But that seems to go against books like Jubilees, which say. Uh, let's see where what it says. Um, it says Does anybody else have a frozen frame? Yes, sir. It's frozen up. I think he's gone catatonic. He's always been a little that way. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll recover in a minute. Oh, yeah. He's kicked off now. Give him a second. Sorry about that. I hate the internet that I have. I mean, it's pretty good. Can't complain too much. But so far in the meetings we've been doing, it's cut me out. Usually, like at least once during our meeting. So that's really frustrating. So I don't know. You need to get a better internet connection or something. I don't know about, again, my apologies for that. So, uh, well, the passage that I was just reading it is verse 14 of Jubilees chapter 6. And it to me, it suggests that the, first of all, it tells us the origination of the daily offering. The daily offering that's offered every morning and evening did not originate before the time of Moses. It originated with Moses. And we were told that this originated in order that they could have forgiveness for an atonement for the, it, it connects it with the whole blood thing. To atone for blood, it requires uh, the daily offerings. Let me see if someone says that. Okay. All right. So now, now let's see where where I left off here. Okay. It tells us that what's it tells us the origin of the feast of weeks actually exists. Noah. Well, it tells us that Noah was the first human to observe the Feast of Weeks. So prior to Noah, no one observed the Feast of Weeks on earth, but in heaven, the angels observed it. It says in verse 18 of chapter six, Jubilees, this whole festival was celebrated in heaven from the day of creation till the days of Noah, 26 Jubilees in five weeks of years. And Noah and his sons observed it for seven jubilees in one week of years till the day of Noah's death. And from the day of Noah's death, his sons did away with it until the days of Abraham, and they ate blood. But Abraham observed it, and Isaac and Jacob and his children observed it up to thy days. And in thy days, the children of Israel forgot it until you celebrated it anew on this mountain. So we're told that the history of, of Shavuot was observed by the angels introduced to Noah, and it was instituted as a covenant, an annual covenant, and Noah and his sons observed it all the way till Noah died, and then his, the rest of his family were like, okay, Noah's dead now, we don't want to do this anymore, so they stopped doing it, and they started eating blood. They forsook the covenant of Noah, but then Abraham was chosen to restore the covenant of Noah, so he restored it, and it, Abraham and his children and offspring kept it all the way up until the time of Moses. So even in Egypt, they were 
they, according to the Jubilees, even in Egypt, they were honoring the Feast of Weeks. Then, when Moses was born, they stopped honoring it. In, in the time of Moses, they, they forsook it. And then well, it was restored back to Moses. So that was the, the history of, of the observance of Shavuot from the beginning up until time of Moses. The other thing is it, t it tells us, verse 21, it is a feast of weeks and the feast of first fruits. This feast is twofold in a, and of a double nature. Uh, so we're also told earlier that it's a feast of oaths because of the word in Hebrew, Shavuot, it's like a play on words. It, it means seven, it means week. It can also mean oath. So the feast of oaths and the feast of weeks, it's the same. And that's because on the feast of weeks, the oath or covenant was made with Noah in all life that he would not, the creator would not send a flood to destroy all life and that they would abstain from, from shedding blood and from eating people shed blood and they ate blood. Okay. Another very, a very uh, powerful passage uh, is the, it says in verse 22 of chapter 6, I have written in the book of the first law, in that which I have written for thee, that thou should celebrate it in its season, one day in the year. And I explain to thee its sacrifices, that children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout the generations in this month, one day in every year. Now, so let's take a look at Deuteron Deuteronomy. It's Greek. It means second law. So the book of Deuteronomy is the book of the second law. There's a phrase in the Dead Sea Scrolls that also refers to the book of the second law. And the fact that Jubilee says the book of the first law if there's a first law, it implies that there might be a second law, because what's first typically is followed by a second. You don't typically say, my first son, unless you have more than one son. So the fact that this is the book of the first law implies that there is also a book of the second law. According to Jubilees, the book of the first law was written before the book of Jubilees. So... According to Jubilees, Jubilees was written during the first 40 days. When Moses went up for, for 40 days, that's when Jubilees was written. During that same 40 days, the book of the first law was also written. And it was written by, it says, um, for I have written in the book of the first law. It was, it was an angel. An angel wrote in the book of the first law. Remember what Paul said? Paul said, and, and in Acts, it says that the law was given by angels. So the angel speaking from, from Jubilees, we know that Jubilees was, is claiming to be written by angels. But the angel that's claiming to write Jubilees also says, I have written in the book of the first law. So whatever this book of the first law was, according to Jubilees, it was written by the same angel that is writing the book of Jubilees. And I discovered last year a very amazing thing. Uh, what, what verse are we looking at? That's the verse, um, chapter 6 of Jubilees, verse 22. And what's very amazing is I've actually discovered evidence that, you know, like, back in 2011, I came with a discovery that, that the Temple School is the original Deuteronomy. And I revealed that to people. I started teaching it. And Jackson Snyder read it, read what I wrote about it at first with a skeptical mindset. And then as he was reading more of what I said about it, it made a lot of sense to him. And he kind of agreed with me that the Temple Scroll is the earlier version of Deuteronomy. Um, but I discovered something a year or two ago along the same level of importance as the Temple Scroll thing. 
I discovered that there's evidence that this did not happen. This whole thing with Temple Scroll became, that's not the only thing that happened. There was a book called the Book of the First Law, or if you were to use the Greek, Protonomy or something. You know, we have Deuteronomy. It would have been like Protonomy or something. But basically, this earlier book had the first law. The second law, what, according to Deuteronomy, what's the second law about? It's the law for when you get into the land and have a temple. That's the law in the temple school. When you have a temple, here's the law in the land. What's the book of Exodus? It's the law in the wilderness. When you have, when you don't have a temple, when you have a, when you have the tabernacle. So the book of the first law is for tabernacle worship. The book of the second law is for temple worship. And it, from what I've seen, basically, just like we have the temple scroll, there was also a tabernacle scroll which once existed and could potentially be found one day in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the temple scroll is all about the temple, the, law, the book of Deuteronomy, but with the temple worship in mind. The tabernacle scroll, on the other hand, would basically be the book of Exodus and Leviticus, but an earlier version, which was a single scroll, it had all the laws from Exodus and Leviticus, as well as extra laws not currently in our copies. So it would have been analogous to the Temple Scroll, but simply in the, in the context of the tabernacle. So the passages from Exodus, which talk about the, the, uh, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, would actually come from this fir book of first law that no longer exists. What I discovered is... When you put, I, I do believe the chapters have been rearranged somewhat in Exodus and Leviticus, but overall, they're still in roughly the correct order. Because they're in roughly the correct order, even looking at our current copies of Exodus and Leviticus, a striking harmonization with Temple Scroll is found. What we see is that the order of the passages of the laws in Exodus and Leviticus follows your order of the laws in the temple scroll. Just like the temple scroll, we start off with the laws for the tabernacle slash temple. Also, in the beginning of the temple scroll, there's laws for the Ark of the Covenant. Same thing with Exodus. And then there's, you know, there's laws for the, the incense, offering of incense, and the, uh, some of the priests, some of the garments of the priest. Then it moves on to, um, it moves on in Exodus. There's some laws of of the uh, Sabbath, which comes after. Same thing in the Temple Scroll. Then after that comes sacrifices in the beginning of Leviticus, and in the Temple Scroll, right after comes all the sacrifices. It gives the detailed laws about sacrifices. After that comes the the uncleanness laws, Leviticus chapter 11 and 12. It talks about unclean animals and unclean fluids. And then it progresses um, in, it, it talks about, you know, leprosy and in the Leviticus chapter 13, 14, then moves on to the bodily, bodily fluids in chapter 15. It was um, chapter... 12 of Leviticus, which speaks of the, the 40, the woman who gives birth and has to be purified for 40 or 80 days. And in, in Leviticus chapter 16, it talks about the Day of Atonement and, bearing, and covering the blood with dust. Well, what we see in the Temple Scroll, it follows that same flow. Right after the sacrifices comes the unclean animals passage laws, then follows the the passages about the the woman of uh, 40 and 80 days and then talks about the passages about leprosy and and the um, then the emissions it talks about those and then it talks right after it talks about bear, bearing covering the blood so it's like following an, an amazing correspondence so the evidence to me indicates that there was a 
special scroll which had a earlier version of Exodus chapter 16 all the way to Leviticus chapter 27. An earlier version, different order of laws, just like Temple Scroll, and extra laws, just like Temple Scroll. So Jubilees provides us evidence that such a scroll once existed when it refers to the Book of the First Law. Because um, it can't, the Book of the First Law, as Jubilees talks about, cannot be referring to Leviticus in its current form, or Numbers, or Exodus in its current form, because all three of those books have passages which, which happen after the time Jubilees is written. So the fact that Jubilees is re referring to a book that has already been written prior to Jubilees, prior to basically a book of the, of the first law that was written on the mountain during the 40 days, uh, it explains, uh, it shows that there must have been another book. And it makes a lot of sense that this is the case because, like, imagine you're on the mountain for 40 days. What's, Mount, what's Moses doing for 40 days? It says he went on the mountain, in Exodus it says he went on the mountain and received the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments does not take 40 days to write down. So what was happening during the 40 days? Well, if he was being taught an entire book of law, first the book of the first law, if he was being taught that whole law, and if he was being taught the book of Jubilees, the history of the whole earth, well, it makes sense how that could take 40 days, take you 40 days to become an expert in his law, and 40 days to become an expert in the history of all mankind, that makes sense. Oh, okay, that would take like 40 days of non-stop instruction and revelation. 40 days to get 10 commandments, two tablets, that doesn't make sense. So that's a, Jubilees provides a strong, striking connection there for that. That's I feel is very important for restoring, using the Dead Sea Scrolls and all the evidence we have to restore a earlier version of the Torah. I'm actually going to be working in the future on making a special version of the, of the Pentateuch. And I intend to use the Dead Sea Scrolls, Book of Jubilees, and other sources to reconstruct the whole thing, not just Deuteronomy. I've already done a preliminary version of the Temple Scroll. But I'm going to make a preliminary version of the entire Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy, in the original version that I believe once existed, using all these sources that we have. So it's going to be a much more powerful version of the Torah, I believe. It's going to be much closer to the to what the original Torah was. And we have talked in the Ahad about when was the Torah written, the, the five books, the Pentateuch. I think that in uh, I think that the Pentateuch was probably written in the time of Solomon, from my perspective. I think that the the book of the first law and the book of the second law, in their original forms, was written by Moses or or an angel or something during the time of Moses. But that over time. Mm -hmm. Those Book of the Laws were then edited to make the, the Pentateuch. And I, I think it was edited and made into the Pentateuch around the time of Solomon or sometime after. One of the things we focus on in the Ahad is the, the whole thing of the holy days, the festivals, the sacred times, Sabbaths. So to, do, to focus on those things, we need to, to observe the proper calendar. A lot of people do not believe that the which calendar you, you observe is important. But according to the to Jubilees, it's extremely important. And that if you don't keep it on the proper calendar, it's as if you're not even keeping it at all because you have forsaken, forsaken the holiness of the correct day. It speaks of, it says, in ver where it talks about the calendar thing. We, I'll, I'll read the, the whole thing not the whole chapter, but I'll read the part about the calendar. It says, it speaks of the four days of remembrance that Noah instituted, but then it says, there's no neglecting of this for a single year or from year to year. Command that the children of Israel that they should observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and they will constitute a complete year. Uh, a complete year 
and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts. For everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feasts. But if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons, and the years will be dislodged from this. And they will disturb the seasons and the years will be dislodged, and they will neglect their ordinances. And all the children of Israel will forget, and they will not find the path of the years, and will forget the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths, and they will go wrong to, as to all the order of the years. For I know, and from thence, henceforth will I declare unto thee, and it is not my own devising, for the book lies written before me. And on the heavenly tablets the division of days is ordained, lest they forget the feasts of the covenant and walk according to the feasts of the Gentiles, after their error and after their ignorance. For there will be those who will surely make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year ten days too soon. For this reason the years will come upon them when they, disturb, when they will disturb, and they will make an abominable day the day of testimony, and an unclean day a, a feast day. And they will confound all the days, the holy with the unclean, and the unclean day with the holy. For they will go wrong as to the months and Sabbaths and feasts and jubilees. For this reason I command and testify to thee that thou may testify to them. For after their, thy death, thy children will disturb, so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason they will go wrong as to the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals. And they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. So that was a long passage, but all that to say is that in order to honor the covenant of Noah, we have to keep the proper calendar. The covenant of Noah is central to our foundation of the Yahad, I believe. And to properly keep the covenant of Noah, you have to do the right festival, the, the right, the right uh, holy days, the holy time, the proper calendar. And... We're told in Jubilees that it's the 364-day calendar, the solar calendar, which the Essenes we know observed according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and according to the various books like Enoch. We know that the, the, in the New Testament books, we know that the apostles and the Messiah observed a solar calendar. And what's interesting is that it connects the whole idea with if you do not observe the solar calendar, if the Israelites stop observing the solar calendar, that means they, are, they have fallen away from the covenant. And because they fall away from the covenant of Noah, they will also start eating blood. So if they're going to be faithful to the covenant of Noah, they're going to keep the proper festivals, and they're going to be, they're going to be eating purely. And so they're going to be celebrating the proper holy times purely, and they're going to be eating purely. But if they abandon the covenant of Noah, their festivals will no longer be pure. And one of the parts about festivals is, is food. In the scriptures, there's food involved. So if they have impure festivals, it's only a logical next step that their, their festival food will also be impure. And this idea that the food will be unclean as well because they will start eating the blood, contrary to the covenant of Noah. So by forsaking the solar calendar, it leads inevitably to becoming impure in your life. By keeping to the solar calendar, you are maintaining the purity of the original covenant of Noah. That's what Jubilees makes that connection for us. Um, okay, so Allison asked, the originals, I assume, of the Torah or the Pentateuch, were they destroyed during the Babylonian captivity? And then were they rewritten? when people were commanded to return to Israel. Yeah, I believe, according to Second Ezra, it discusses this, not just the Pentateuch, but the entire Old Testament writings up to that time, since some of the Old Testament writings hadn't even existed yet. But the ones that did, they were restored by Ezra, I believe. And so what did Ezra restore? He did not restore the original law books that were written by Moses. He restored the edited versions that Solomon and his scribes created. The original version of the law was, pla was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. So I believe um, to find the original law would probably be, it probably will only be discovered with the Ark of the Covenant. Um, but in the main, I think the original version that Solomon wrote 
the redacted version of the law, I think that's a very faithful preservation of the original Torah, whereas the Torah we have today is not a faithful representation of that Torah that Moses first wrote. It's, a, it's very far removed because, so here's the, train, here's the transmission we have. We have the original Torah written by Moses. The original Torah was first Torah, second Torah. No narrative at all. So Moses, when he wrote the first and second Torah, he didn't write any narrative at all. I also believe he wrote a testament of his life, just like the testaments of the patriarchs and everything. We know the author of Jude, which I believe was Jude, endorses the testament of Moses as authentic. We don't have the full testament, so I believe the full testament had much more of Moses' life. So I believe Moses wrote a testament about his life, the first and second law, and then in the time of Solomon, it's unclear to me if, Gen if Moses also wrote Genesis or not. If, did he write Genesis, or was Genesis written by Mo Solomon's scribes as well? In either case, I believe Solomon took the two law books that Moses wrote, as well as the Testament of Moses, he took Moses' Testament and said, okay, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a, uh, a, I'm going to make a overview of the entire history of Moses from, and from the creation till now, I'm going to make an overview for people, uh, because the, the two books of law, let's face it, a lot of people don't like to read law books because it seems tedious but if it was written as a narrative that that's more relevant to people oh it's a narrative okay now i understand why these laws were given okay so it's like a, it's flowing when it has a narrative so i believe that's what happened next solomon scribes took the history of moses that they summarized from moses testament and then they took the first and second law and placed it into the narrative that they created and then after that, they, you know, co scribes copied it for, for hundreds of years, and then it was lost in the Babylonian exile, restored by Ezra, and then either the Jews or the Samaritans, they started altering the Torah significantly by taking away passages, rearranging things as they preferred, replacing words with other words that they thought were more accurate. So now... We have a Torah that's full of errors. There's a lot of errors. There's inconsistencies, contradictions, and holes. There's a lot of holes and gaps, which don't explain sufficiently aspects of the law. So that's what we have currently as the Torah, I believe. And that falsified Torah, that, that more corrupted version of the Torah, I think is dated to around the 2nd century BC or 3rd century BC, right around there. So the way to restore the Torah is to use the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, uh, Samaritan, sources like Jubilees, which provide parallel accounts, Old Latin, which is similar to Septuagint, and then on a rare occasion, we'll take the Masoretic into consideration. Well, let me rephrase. We will always consider the Masoretic text, but only as a source of comparison and to try to figure out what the original Hebrew of uh, certain passages are, because well, I do believe more often than not, Samaritan Torah is the more authentic Hebrew, but there are certain places where the Samaritan is clearly inferior to the Masoretic. Like, for example, one of the big examples is the Masoretic spells it as Benjamin with an N. The Samaritan spells it with a later, uh, a late spelling spells it as Benjamin with an M at the end. So there are examples like that where the Samaritans altered things in their copies. Uh, I think more just for grammatical reasons because their language changed over time. Just like, for example, we don't, we don't do these and thous and thys anymore because that's more archaic. The same thing happened with the Samaritans in their Hebrew. They didn't say Benjamin because Benjamin was a more archaic thing that people didn't really say anymore. They didn't say the N. As, uh, in Hebrew, the, the correct plural that's used um, is I-M, im, for masculine, but it wasn't always like that. In the past, Hebrew had two plurals. It had an im and it had an im. The im is preserved in Aramaic as the, pl the masculine plural, 
and the im is preserved in Hebrew as the masculine plural. But the original Hebrew had both im and im, and there's evidence in the Bible of certain places of archaic im, I-N endings, like Benjamin, for example. But so that's just an example of how the Samaritan Torah altered things as well uh, for grammatical reasons, up because the language changed over time. Um, let's see. One other question was asked here. Let's see. Um, it's not clear to me if the Jews or the Samaritans did it, but I, I think it's very possible the Samaritans are responsible for the altered Torah because the reason I say that is in the Temple Scroll, there's very specific laws which make sense more, only in the context of like the Jerusalem, for example. Um, but it doesn't explicitly say Jerusalem, but it makes sense in the context of a very specific temple. Now, there are, there's, a, there's passages in the Torah which speak of the building an altar on Mount Gerizim. And the Masoretic text says Mount Ebal, but I think that was a change by the Jews. So I think the original was build an altar on Mount Gerizim, the mountain of blessing. And the Samaritans saw that and they're like, oh, we should, we should, uh, we should build a temple on Mount Gerizim. And the reason they did that is because in the in book of Ezra and Nehemiah, they wanted to join the Israelites and build a temple with them. Remember, they wanted to join, but Nehemiah said, no, you cannot join us. Because Nehemiah refused to join, they felt like offended and like, okay, well, if you don't let us join you with your temple, then we're going to make our own temple. That's basically how they approached it. So because of that, the Samaritans built their own temple somewhere else. And then um, because there were certain laws, like if since they built their own temple, some of the laws in their writings was no longer relevant to them. So because it was no longer relevant to them, they removed the law. I think that I, uh, the other possibility is that the Jews did that because the Jews built their temple and their temple was not properly built either the second temple. So both the Samaritans and the Jews did have a motivation to remove the passages of the temple, of building the temple from the temple scroll. Um, so all I'll say, it's a complicated issue of who exactly created the altered version of the second temple period. Um, but the fact that, how did the Samaritans, like if the, if the Jews altered it, why would the Samaritans take the Torah from the altered Torah from the Jews. Um, and why would the Samaritans take the altered Torah uh, from the, like b both sides, why would they take the altered Torah from the other? There does appear to be one um, time where it would make sense that the other group would take the other Torah. And that's during the Maccabean uh, times, because during the Maccabean times, we're told in Second Maccabees that all the books of the law were being destroyed again. Let me just quickly, I know this is a tangent, but it's a very good tangent. Hold on. And we're going to bring this to a close in just a minute because we're getting close to the uh, end of our time here. But uh, hold on a sec. It's in Sick and Maccabees, and it says... Okay. Chapter 2 of, Mac, of Second Maccabees, verses 13 and 14, it says, The same things are reported in the records and in the memoirs of Nehemiah, and also that he founded a library and collected the books about the kings and prophets, and the writings of David, and letters of kings about votive offerings. In the same way, Judas, it's referring to Judas Maccabeus, Judas also collected all the books that had been lost on account of the war which had come upon us, and they are in our possession. So if you have need of them, amazing is that it appears that what Second Maccabees is saying is that because of the war that the Jews had with the, with the Greeks, the Maccabees, uh, the Maccabees fled into the wilderness, and they, they revolted against 
the Greeks. And because the Greeks persecuted them so much, they destroyed a lot of the copies of the law and the books of scripture. So the Maccabees did a special effort to preserve the books of the law and the books of the other prophets. And they basically, they sought out all the Israelites and said, anyone, anyone, do you guys have a copy of this book? Do you have a copy of this book? And everyone put their resources together and they came up with a copy of at least one of each book and they put it all together. And it was all given to Judah Maccabee. And Judah, when he had all the books, they had them in the possession in the Maccabean capital. And they said, if you have need of them, send people to get them and we'll give you copies of those all of all the books. So what that is, well, that's amazing to me is because uh, it's amazing because it appears that the Maccabees are the Qumranites. I know not everyone agrees with that interpretation, but I think there's a good number, a good amount of evidence that there's so many things similar to the Maccabees with the Essenes. Like the Essenes were radicals in many ways, and they, you know, they a lot of these ideas of associated with the Maccabees are associated with the Essene people in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I think who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, who preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls? I think it was the the Essene movement started by Maccabees who were preserving it. And that's in chapter Maccabees, Second Maccabees, chapter two, verses thirteen and fourteen, which alludes to these lost books that they recovered. So, um, if the Samaritans, we you know the Samaritans were persecuted. So, if the Samaritans lost their five books of the law, they would have needed to get their their book of law from the Jews. The Jews, the Samaritans would have been like, we don't, we don't have our law anymore. Can you give us a copy? So the Jews would have had to give them copies, or it could have been the other way around. Um, the, the Jews might have, might have needed to get copies from the Samaritans because the, the, they lost the Book of Law. So they tried to find the Book of Law again, and they had the one version preserved by the Maccabees and the other version preserved by the Samaritans. Well, if the Samaritan version was more popular amongst regular people, the Jews would have been like, okay, let's go with that one. Uh, so that could be a time when either the Jews or Samaritans would have gone wholesale over to the other group's Torah. So in my view, there was the original Torah that, that Solomon redacted. And that redaction of Solomon was restored by Ezra. And then either Jews or the Samaritans altered the redaction majorly. And then during the time of the Maccabees, the other side needed needed cop they were trying to find copies of the law and they preferred the corrupted version over Solomon's version. That's how I see. Um, okay, Jackson, you said I faded out when I gave the reference. Yeah, but you gave it again, I think. Yeah. That Maccabee's so reference. I also note that <clears throat> that um, what, what we understand is the Hasidim mentioned in 2nd and 1st Maccabees are, are what we would call Enochians or Essenes today. They're not the same as the Hasidim of modern times. And it appears that they joined as partners with the Maccabees, but then later on the um, Maccabees, according to the book, turned on them, which caused an exile. But the fact is, there is no fact here. We don't know. This is the, the closest we can get to it. Well, the original Maccabees, Maccabees were, you know, pure and motivated by faithfulness and oh, yeah. holiness. But then, as we know, within a, one or two generations, the Maccabean movement collapsed and became a corrupt movement. And I think, I think what happened is that the Maccabean movement collapsed and splintered into the three groups. So I think the original thing, the whole Maccabean movement, I think was the original uni United Judaism. And then the Maccabean thing fell apart. The, the three groups, the Essenes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. I think that's what happened. Now that's a great observation. It makes sense. Oh, by yeah. Especially when you think of the uh, 
Zadokite priesthood being pretty much routed out of there at 175 just just before that. It does also explain some of the similarities that the Sadducees have with the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Because some people, some people draw those parallels that, oh, the Sadducees had some similar interpretations of the law. Uh, so it could make sense how the Sadducees came out of that. And then the, the Pharisees, they have something in co some things in common with the Essenes as well. So I, I could see how they all come out of that. And the different Christian groups too, like the different Gnostic groups. There's a lot of, there's certain things in, in the Gnostic groups which appear uh, to be things. Let me see, is there anything to say before we end this? This might be a good place to end it here. Um, we might go over this next time, but basically just as a little preview thing, Noah tells his sons, gives his sons like an explanation of what happened before the flood, why all the horrible things happened, and gives them commands to be righteous. And those commands are sh sh uh, shockingly in line with Acts chapter 15. There, there's a lot of similarities. So it appears that Acts chapter 15 is telling people to, uh, is basically telling people to follow the covenant of Noah because. The fact that it emphasizes the blood in Acts chapter 15, that's a very important connection. The same thing with, with um, it says abstain from sexual immorality. Well, you've got in the, you've got in, let's see, um, let me just go to that quickly. It says, Okay, it says, guard their, he commanded them to guard their soul, Noah commanded them to guard their souls from fornication, uncleanness, and all iniquity. Um, so the whole thing with the fornication that Noah was focusing on. So that's like, Acts chapter 15 speaks of fornication. It, uh, abstaining from fornication, abstaining from blood. And that, that's very central to the whole covenant of Noah thing. So I think that's, that's something important for us to look into. How does Acts chapter 15 tie in with the whole covenant of Noah? Yeah. And the, the fact that it emphasizes the blood, that's very important. So for the takeaway from all this is uh, for the Yahad, you know, are to, to be pure in our bodies and actions. And specifically regarding to animals, we are to respect them, respect their blood, and not to eat the blood, but to, and not to shed the blood of others, especially humans, mm -hmm. because they're the image, they're the image of Elohim. Mm -hmm. And to shed the blood of another is a great sin that requires uh, major uh, atonement needed to purify the land. But so we can go into more of that next time we do the teaching. Great. Well, uh, next time, what? Uh... What time do you think you'd be available, Andrew? Um, let's see. Next, so next week, what would that? Would you prefer Saturday or Sunday? Uh, Sunday, if if it's available to you. Okay. When when are we? When are the only well, event that we have on Sunday? And it looks like a good number of people are turning out. When when uh, on Sunday is convenient for you guys? Three thirty. <laughs> Three thirty is that the only time slot? No, That's good. you pick. You pick the time. We'll show up. Um, but you guys sometimes have meetings on Sundays, though. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Yeah, is we it, could do it earlier. Is does it work w with you guys if we were to do? Uh, if I was to do like something around twelve or twelve thirty. Yeah. And then that would be done in time for your two o'clock meeting. Yeah, that'd be great. How about like? Noon 30. Yeah, noon 30. You all feel good about that? And I want to thank you all for coming. I see we've got some I haven't seen for a while, like Navajo, and, and we've got Javier and some of the others, Dowd. Thank you for coming. And uh, this, Onia, this is really good. I appreciate it. And you waiting for me. That was...
Kind of. No, no worries. Uh, okay. If anybody has any questions or wants to say more things about what we talked, you can, you can always talk about it in the Ahad group or sure. message me or something. This goes right up on YouTube as well. So go out there and I think it's going on my channel. So uh, if you got comments or questions, it would be really nice to have some people that have been here to actually go out there and say that it's worthwhile. Maybe we can get a few strangers to come. <laughs> sure. Okay, great. Hey, thank you, Ani. That yeah, was you're great. welcome. That's shalom, shalom man. Thank yeah, you. shalom, guys. I appreciate you taking your time.